Our topic, as you know tonight, is the Navy and national security. And we're privileged to be addressed by the senior uniformed officer of the Navy, the Chief of Naval Operations. Admiral Trost graduated number one in his class from the Naval Academy in 1949. 53, Frank. 53, I'm not that old. <laughs> If I, if I pause, it's going to be 55, 57. <laughs> He's a submariner by his early training in the Navy. He was commander of the nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarine, the Sam Rayburn. He's held a number of, of staff assignments of note with the Secretary of Defense's office, with the Secretary of the Navy, and two major systems and uh, programs jobs with prior uh, chiefs of naval operation. His command positions have included deputy chief of, uh, or, or deputy commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet, commander of the United States Seventh Fleet, commander in chief of the U.S. Atlantic Fleet, and concurrently the deputy commander in chief of the U.S. Atlantic Command. He was appointed on the 30th of June, 1986, as the United States Navy's 23rd Chief of Naval Operations. It's an enormous pleasure to introduce and present Admiral Carlisle A. H. Trost, Chief of Naval Operations. Dr. Bird, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen, thank you first and foremost for giving me an opportunity to spend time with you this evening. I think I should begin with a commercial. Uh, yes, I'm going to talk about the Navy, really an aspect of international affairs which affects the Navy and all of you. But most importantly, I want to compliment all of you not for coming to hear me speak, but for your interest in what goes on in our world. If I were to attribute any shortcoming to the American public, I would say it is the failure to keep informed on those things that impact our country, our people, and our freedom. I am particularly disturbed by the events of the day. I was asked earlier this evening by young man whom I'd met out in the reception, whether or not I plan to address the budget tonight. Uh, I don't directly, but I hope someone would have a question or two on the subject. <laughs> it's difficult to shift from what is in Washington today, the day-to-day -to -day line of thought, that is, what's happening in the budget, to tonight and what's happening in the real world. But I'm going to try to do some of that by talking to you a little bit about what I call the Soviet Naval Arms Offensive, really Arms Control Offensive. Sounds a little different, doesn't it? Many of you will recall the general surprise that overtook the Western world last summer when Mr. Gorbachev, Secretary General of the Soviet Union, in an interview with an Indonesian newspaper, revealed that the Soviet Union was willing to accept the so-called zero-zero option for the INF Treaty. This, calls, this treaty calls for the elimination of all intermediate range nuclear missiles, not only from Europe, but also from Asia. Quite a si significant step, because at long last, after many years of negotiations, marked as it seemed only by disappointed hopes, the INF Treaty promised to become a reality. So people said perhaps the intractable Soviets are undergoing a change of heart. I should say, first of all, that in my view, that treaty is a good treaty. For the first time in history, we've seen an asymmetric reduction in armaments. The Soviet Union is giving up systems capable of carrying a total of four times as many nuclear warheads as this country will eliminate and it's eliminating them worldwide. The other service chiefs and I support the treaty as being in our country's national interests, and we hope and believe that our Senate will quickly ratify it. 
<clears throat> now, what was not so widely covered in that interview in Indonesia, although it occupied a much larger part of Mr. Gorbachev's remarks, was a series of comments about another kind of arms control, the kind I want to talk to, to about tonight, naval arms control. Here, Mr. Gorbachev assumed once again the role that he seems to like best, at the podium of an orchestra of peace that I will call the Soviet Pops, conducting an original work of his own composition. Among other things, his masterful baton evoked the following pleasant sounding themes. First, that the superpower should keep naval platforms armed with nuclear weapons out of missile range of each other's homelands. That major naval exercises in the Pacific should be limited to one or two a year. Guess who conducts most of those? That certain areas should be set aside in which no anti-submarine warfare forces, including aircraft, would operate. That the numbers of deployments of nuclear-capable aircraft in the Far East should be frozen. And that various multilateral agreements restricting the introduction of nuclear weapons or other military forces should be observed. Sounds good. These concepts have been very well received by many people within the Pacific region. Well-educated and honorable people yearning for peace. Sometimes their hopes are naively expressed, but we can all, all appreciate their concern. Certain governments have also embraced these concepts. For example, take New Zealand's insistence on preventing home port, or port visits rather, by nuclear-capable U.S. warships. That policy has prevailed even amid the resultant wreckage of our guarantees of their security under the ANZUS Treaty. Clearly then, there's a large pocket of world opinion that recoils from even the possibility of a military confrontation by the two superpowers within their region at any level of hostilities. The Soviet Union has been targeting this audience in the Pacific and elsewhere for a number of years. The recent Gorbachev initiatives, remarkable as they may seem, fit into a pattern of Soviet diplomacy that extends back into the 1970s. These actions include support, either through open diplomacy or through guile and interaction, for so-called zones of peace in the Indian Ocean, in the South Atlantic, and most recently in Northern Europe and the Arctic. Also nuclear-free zones in the South Pacific and Korean Peninsula. Also submarine-free zones and anti-submarine-free zones, which from the Soviet perspective are strategically interchangeable. What is equally significant, current Soviet negotiations and the strategic arms reduction talks, the START talks that you're hearing so much about, have attempted to curtail the sea-based nuclear capability represented by sea launch cruise missiles, or SLICMs, an area in which the United States and our Navy have a pronounced advantage. It's clear that these proposals have been carefully orchestrated. If you want unity of opinion, naturally there's no better place than a totalitarian state. But even so, the consistency and the persistency of these proposals have been remarkable. As I said before, they fit a clear pattern, and it's about that pattern that I want to speak more to you about tonight. Before we accept, as written, the sympathy, symphony of Soviet virtue, friendship, and peaceful intention, I'd like to examine what the real motives for current Soviet behavior might be. Today, any discussion of Soviet behavior must begin by focusing on Soviet society. So much seems to be going on over there, and so much of that is contradictory that we are reminded of Winston Churchill's famous observation in 1939. He said, I cannot forecast to you the action of Russia. It is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. 1987 was the year when glasnost, or openness, and perestroika, meaning restructuring, were added to our vocabularies. When the Iron Curtain another Churchillian phrase, seemed ever so slowly and ever so ponderously with much creaking and groaning to lift just a little. Yet toward the end of the year, Gorbachev protege Boris Yeltsin, the Moscow party boss, a man widely credited 
with bringing some real efficiency into that city's government, was fired from his post for making a speech that took perestroika a step too far. And on the 19th of last month, he was dismissed from the ruling Politburo, or as the newspaper, or as Tass rather dryly reported, the Politburo freed comrade B.N. Yeltsin from his duties. What is happening in the Soviet Union is so contradictory that it seems to be a phenomenon understandable only to those who live there, if they themselves do indeed understand it. Glasnost apparently permits the Soviet Union to invite Mother Teresa for a widely publicized visit, after which she reported many encouraging, many encouraging signs of a more liberal view toward religious and other freedoms. But that same Glasnost does not permit Pope John Paul to visit Lithuania to mark the 600th anniversary of that state's association with Roman Catholicism. Under the new regulations, the Soviet people are not to be trusted with strong drink, like vodka. On the other hand, now they can be trusted with what used to be exclusive tools of decadent capitalists, checking accounts and credit cards. Greater decentralization is the avowed goal. Yet last week, demonstrations of Armenian nationalism in Azerbaijan compelled Moscow first to suspend once again the right of public assembly and next to move in with troops. And as a result, published reports indicate 31 citizens have been killed. Following the Chernobyl disaster, the Soviet Union admitted its mistakes and promised to be truthful, open, and honest in the future. And to a greater extent than before, they have been. But on July 22nd of last year, our State Department reported that despite U.S. efforts to set the record straight, many Soviet-inspired news articles were propagating the fiction that the AIDS virus originated not in Africa, but in the United States as a result of some Pentagon biological experiment that went haywire. So much for truth. So the indicators contradict each other. And depending on which account you read, we have either a new Soviet Union struggling to escape the bonds of its past inequities, or an old Soviet Union, repressive, reactionary, which an attractive, liberal-minded statesman is trying to lead against its will into enlightenment and prosperity. But perhaps these contradictions are more apparent than real. I would submit to you tonight that one thread of truth does run rather consistently through all of these efforts. That is the thread of Soviet self-interest. We may now be living in a time when many historical imperatives within the Soviet orbit happen coincidentally to be lining up. No matter how bright and new they seem, none of them is necessarily inconsistent with the ideas of the October 1917 revolution. Take the Soviet economy. Clearly, it has problems. A country almost completely self-sufficient in natural resources with tremendous tracts of arable land needs to import millions of metric tons of wheat every year. The necessities of ordinary life are of poor quality and insufficient in quantity. For most citizens, luxuries are literally out of reach. At the rate that it is sputtered along, the gross national product of this vast empire may well be overtaken by that of China early in the 21st century. So what's the problem? Is it technology? Well, no and yes. Soviet science is highly advanced. All those stories about the powerful Soviet educational machine are well-founded. In certain areas, such as welding, space science, mechanical engineering, the Soviets are world leaders. The problem is that it is very difficult for them to get other technologies out of the laboratory and into the factory. Without the stimulus of competition, Soviet industry continues to do things in outmoded ways. Initiative, enterprise, creativity, all are victims of centralized planning and centralized plans. The better factory managers don't want their superiors to see how easy it is to attain their annual quotas, for then things would be tougher next year. So instead of a commitment to excellence, they stay within the safe middle zone of mediocrity.
This attitude infects their entire economy. It is to this deficiency then, not to any desire for a more liberal society, that Mr. Gorbachev is addressing perestroika. As one knowledgeable observer has written, Gorbachev's reforms are topical, not revolutionary, in that they aim in making the bad old system work better rather than changing the basic system. The same self-interest can be found in the military sector. Since the 1960s, the Soviet Union has spent incredible sums of money on their military capability. On the order, it is reported of 15 percent of their gross national product each year, two to three times what we spend. They have a huge numerical superiority in weapons and personnel, far exceeding any legitimate needs for defense. And yet, in key areas, they have not been able to catch up to us, let alone to go ahead. Our Army and our Navy have always been the beneficiaries of an economy with innate strengths. At the same time, I should say at the time of the American Revolution, our shipyards were able to produce outstanding warships because merchant shipbuilding had been flourishing in the colonies for more than 150 years. Not today. The advanced weapons of the Civil War, made with interchangeable parts, were a natural result of the same inventiveness that led Eli Whitney to design and build the cotton gin. In the Soviet Union, on the other hand, military procurement does not exploit the industrial base. It drives it at a fairly constant level with fairly predictable requirements. As a result, in either the civilian or the military sectors, there has been little incentive for risk-taking or the other qualities of the entrepreneur, the things that truly advance technology. What Mr. Gorbachev is saying, therefore, seems to be we cannot go on indefinitely as a first-rate military power with a second-rate economy. Let us divert some of our resources from the military to the civilian sector or allow it to catch up. I might note that some hear some of that same argument in this country today, but for the wrong reasons. Such a policy has enormous potential in the public arena. Last week, you may have read accounts of Soviet virtue in action once again, announcing that as a result of the INF Treaty, a factory that had previously manufactured SS-20 missiles would now be converted to the manufacture of baby carriages. I would note as an aside that I just last week witnessed pictures taken by the team of potential inspectors who were introduced to that, that factory in the event that it would be one of the sites inspected under the INF Treaty, and it sure didn't look like a baby carriage factory would in Baltimore. Now, all who attended the announcement agreed that this would remedy a major shortcoming in Soviet domestic policy and was clear proof of Soviet sincerity. In this way, by publicizing the campaign of reform, and I would emphasize that, that despite visions of swords being beaten into baby carriages, the publicity has preceded the reform in most every case, and Soviet defense spending continues to rise. But through this outstanding public relations offensive, Mr. Gorbachev accomplishes several very important objectives. He appeals to the peace-loving instincts of the audience I mentioned earlier, which then puts pressure on their own governments. He raises doubts within the NATO alliance over the degree to which the European allies can count on the continued presence of the United States in Europe. He throws the United States on the public relations to defensive, making it easier to get subsequent arms agreements on favorable terms. And he undermines the resolve of our people to be strong and resist threats against our vital interests. That sounds like a pretty successful program, doesn't it? Whether it will succeed or not remains to be seen. Internally, Mr. Gorbachev faces tremendous resistance from those who have a vested interest in maintaining the old, decrepit, inefficient, graft-written, but comfortable architecture. Although his reforms sound good in theory, there is a tremendous distance, literally and figuratively, between Moscow and the implementors and the outlying republics. Where nationalism, avarice, and the traditional peasant mistrust of government tend to give perestroika a Siberian welcome. To the military elite, he must show results, and quickly. Soviet industry must begin to produce the high technology items
for which the military hungers, or the holiday will soon be over. Complicating all these factors are deeply entrenched attitudes from long ago, an almost obsessive, protective feeling about Russian soil, for which so many men and women have died, together with a great suspicion of and ignorance about the West. It's one thing for Mr. Gorbachev to offer the promise of a new Soviet Union, and it's quite another for his own political base to accept the changes that must attend the execution of such a promise. A country that, until recently, has banished from official publications the very name of another Soviet reformer, Nikita Khrushchev, is not perhaps the best place to raise expectations about a new form of detente. In any event, before we make up our minds, we must wait for Soviet words to be followed by actions. Despite perestroika, there has been little change in the outward manifestations of Soviet policy. At various levels of conflict, the Soviets continued to inject themselves into the affairs of weaker states. In Afghanistan, Cambodia, Angola, Nicaragua, and others. Unlike any democracy, but like all despotic empires, the Soviets continued to apply coercion against their friends. Their military retains a huge capability, including an aggressive, offensive navy for which they have no strategic need. Having built for quantity in the past, their navy is now building for quality and is using every assistance that their intelligence community and our technical base can squeeze out of the softer and truer glasnost that exists in this country and in the West. If the Soviets do wish to reduce arms and the tensions that accompany them, we must remember that this development may only be temporary and is certainly readily reversible. And that brings me back to the central theme of my remarks tonight, the Soviet naval arms control offensive. In short, its intent, it's clear, and it's simple. Mr. Gorbachev wants to restrict the mobility, flexibility, and capability of Western military power where those proved, proved to be particularly troublesome to him. That means imposing or getting us to accept limitations on our maritime power. He knows what he's doing because our access to the sea lanes of the world permits commercial trade and free communications on which we depend for our vitality. Our ability to defend those sea lanes and project power, if necessary, in support of our friends and allies helps to control crises, to promote stability, and to deter war. A deployed fleet has unique advantages over other types of military units. On station around the world, conducting live operations, presence, and training, it is never far from the scene of any potential crises. Arriving just over the horizon, it immediately transforms the strategic, the strategic equation while remaining in international waters where it needs no foreign government's permission to operate. If force is required, that force can be applied with precision, with little risk of escalation, and without committing troops ashore. Once the crisis is over, the ships simply change course for a new operating area without ever needing to regroup and without signaling retreat. Our country has relied on naval forces throughout its history. Today, with two long friendly borders to the north and south, and with an extensive web of commercial and security interests across the oceans, the United States is essentially a continental island, more dependent upon the seas than ever. Because we do need a capable Navy, and because that need is well recognized, we maintain a degree of maritime super superiority that now finds itself as the target of many of these Soviet diplomatic and public relations offensives. As a maritime nation then, with no global ambitions other than those of peace and commerce, the United States has consistently supported a policy to keep as much of the seas open for lawful use as is possible. For example, we adhere to the tradition of the three mile limit of territorial seas, although we are prepared to recognize a 12 mile limit for other nations. Within the territorial seas, we permit what is called innocent passage, the movement of ships and aircraft that have no possible threatening connection. The Soviet government, on the other hand, has consistently tried to limit the free movement of naval forces. From the perspective of, an, of a land power self-contained and self-sufficient, 
The Soviets find little that they need from the oceans, but much that they fear. Turning this concept around, history has taught them that in a war with the maritime powers, if they can win at sea, they cannot lose on land. As a result, therefore, any treaty, law, or practice that would restrict the maritime nations from exercising their full rights to use international waters. From time to time, they send us a signal to that effect, just as they did in the Black Sea last month when two of their ships rammed two of ours, exercising their right under international law of innocent passage. The same rationale obtains for all these Soviet initiatives in support of nuclear or military free zones, zones of peace, submarine zones, anti-submarine restricted areas and the like. To the wishful among us, they sound like wonderful ideas from a nation firmly committed to a new peace. In reality, they are merely well-timed overtures whose only purpose is to reduce Soviet strategic disadvantages. Again, the common thread is Soviet self-interest. Whenever you see a zone of peace being proposed, you can be sure that the Soviets see an area of potential threat. In the northern region, the threat to the Soviets is that offensive operations by our much more capable submarines and other naval forces might go after and sink Soviet ballistic missile submarines in their home waters. Unlike ours, which we consider un invulnerable in the open ocean, theirs are vulnerable even when close to their own home waters. Similarly, the Soviets favor submarine-free zones and anti-submarine-free zones because those would protect them against that same threat. Nuclear-free zones are attractive to the Soviets, not because they would lessen the possibility of nuclear war, but because the absence of nuclear-based, nuclear sea-based nuclear sea capability would undermine our policy of flexible response. If that ever happened, the Soviets, with their tremendous advantages in conventional forces, would have a free hand in Europe, knowing that the United States would be unlikely to act against them if the only option available were an all-out nuclear attack. In particular, the capability of our surface ships and our submarines, carefully positioned all around the surface periphery, the Soviet periphery, and armed with high-tech cruise missiles, poses such an effective deterrence and is therefore so troublesome to the Soviet Union that Mr. Gorbachev has attempted to link removal of these missiles to any further advances or success in the strategic arms talks. The conclusions that I'd like to leave with you then are these. First, despite what appears to be a promising development within Soviet borders, it has been largely business as usual for the Soviet Union beyond its own borders. The threat posed by their huge military, including direct intervention, remains a threat. And second, despite the seeming sincerity, love of peace, and desire for friendship radiating from these Soviet initiatives for naval arms control, the real motive is to reduce an area of disadvantage at little cost to themselves by exploiting a coincidence of cultural, economic, and strategic trends. What we must remember is that actions, not words, best describe Soviet intentions. So far, we have had many ensembles of peace, but except for the INF Treaty, there has been very little real music in all these developments. We should remember, too, that maritime nations have seldom benefited from naval disarmament treaties and never from unilateral disarmament. In the 1930s, the Anglo-German Naval Disarmament Treaty was a disaster for British policy. It restricted the British from building warships to meet capital requirements while it permitted Nazi Germany to build, albeit at a lower proportion, more ships than their industry was capable of producing at its fullest capacity anyway. And it allowed them to build submarines. In our own history, disarmament following the undeclared wars with France and with the Barbary pirates at the turn of the 19th century left our coast pathetically vulnerable to forward British maritime power in the War of 1812 as the burning of our national capital subsequently showed. More than a century later, the Washington Naval Conference of the 1920s proved to be one of those misguided policies so, de so seductive in the present, so harmful to the future, that we have adopted all too often in our history and that have led us step by descending step into the abyss of war.
If the Soviets accomplish even one of the goals of their present campaign, our diplomacy will have suffered disaster all over again. And we must remember that unlike the perhaps temporary effects of Glasnost and Perestroika, the effects of our own disarmament would be largely irreversible. My advice then agrees with that of the humorist Finley Peter Dunn, whose famous character Mr. Dooley once observed, trust everybody but cut the cards. I maintain we must cut the cards and then we better watch the dealer's hands very carefully. Thank you. Admiral Trost, we thank you for what uh, is clearly a challenging view of the new foreign policy of the Soviet Union. As is our custom, we will have questions until 10 minutes after 7. With the Admiral's permission, I'll recognize the, the questioner and uh, repeat the uh, questions for the benefit of the audience and the television cameras. Yes, sir. Admiral Trost, in view of uh, needing, obviously, a flexible, efficient, effective response, what kind of Navy do we really need to provide that? And what I have in mind is the debate that goes on between uh, building supersized ships, whether battleships or aircraft carriers, or uh, spending uh, less money and having many smaller ships in order, once some things taken out, we have other things that can respond. What would be your comment on that? The uh, question, of course, is would you comment on the kind of Navy uh, which is required to carry out our, its present missions, and is it affordable? All right, you might, as you might well expect, I will tell you that the kind of Navy we need is the one we are trying to build today. But let me tell you why. We have had to look in this country at what our prospective challenges are. Clearly, we face a global threat, and we must, with our total military capability and that of our friends and allies, be able to deter that threat. If successful in that deterrence, then the most likely conflict that our forces will face are these series of regional and small-scale crises with which we've been engaged, with a few exceptions, ever since World War II. To handle that kind of conflict and that kind of broad situation does require quite a broad range of forces. We have been engaged in the debate over large or small, how many, lots of smaller versus uh, some more capable for as many years as I can remember serving in Washington, and that's over the past 23 years. Uh, we have, over that period of time, come to the conclusion that, for example, with regard to aircraft carriers, it takes a certain size unit to be able to efficiently field a potent combat threat of the kind represented by what is now both necessary to defeat the enemy's technology and available within our own. That doesn't say technology drives the problem, but it does to a degree. Uh, we have rejected the smaller carrier concept over a period of time because the punch of a battle group centered around one or several of those is inadequate to do the worst case job and is marginal when one faces a fairly sophisticated level of threat as was posed by the Libyan air defense capability, for example, in the Mediterranean. So we really have to balance. We have to have a balanced capability among the components of our fleet as well as the capabilities that are represented by that fleet. And unfortunately, that says that we have to have a degree of high technology and sophistication that's adequate to do any job and can defeat what is considered often to be a less sophisticated threat. I would note that that less sophisticated threat is now the beneficiary of arms transfers from ourselves, from the French, from lots of our friends and allies as well as the Soviet Union. So today, for example, uh, our forces in the Persian Gulf have to worry not only about a World War I model of unsophisticated mine which can sink the ship, but they also have to worry about the latest models of anti-ship weapons, missiles, that might come in and strike them. So we live in a world that is not simple in any aspect. Uh, you added affordability. Um, that's one of my favorite subjects. I just gave a briefing on that this morning again. Yes, the defense we propose is affordable. Yes, the 1989 budget, which has been sent up to the Hill, consumes 5.7% of the gross national product, which is the lowest fraction thereof uh, 
except for a few years in the late 70s, and down from about 9.5% in the 50s and in the early 60s, and down from 9% in 1969 when we last had a balanced budget. So if one then uh, reminds the American public that defense doesn't consume the great majority of the federal budget, but in fact uh, more in the neighborhood of 25 to 27 percent, I think it's affordable if the country has the will to afford it. And if not, we better kiss this precious freedom of ours goodbye. Yes, sir. Admiral Trost, I'm Chief Graybill from the Naval Nurse Reserve Association. I have a question on the budget. How will the defense budget affect the Naval Reserve and the uh, new equipment and training in the coming year? The question is, what is the impact of the current budget uh, and potential budget cuts upon uh, the Naval Reserves? There will, first of all, be an impact on Naval Reserve forces of these budget cuts, as there is across the board. Uh, that impact means that we uh, hold the level of reserve, Naval Reserve manning uh, for our selected reserve that we currently have in the budget in 1988. Uh, we intend to continue the force levels of our Naval Reserve Forces, ships, aircraft, and supporting units that we have had. What we're going to have to cut back somewhat is a little bit in the operations and maintenance for those forces, which means that some of the training will be cut back, but in more, in all likelihood, it will be more tailored to meet those highest priority requirements within that force level that we're still budgeting for. We have, as you know, placed a very heavy emphasis on keeping a well-trained, mobilized reserve as an adjunct of our total force capability, and we don't plan to change that policy, even though we have, in 89, reduced the budget 12 percent from what was on the Hill last year. And I just today spent several hours looking at how we're carving up the fiscal year 90 budget, and that's about a 14 percent cut from what was envisioned just a year ago. Yes, sir. Admiral Trost, I enjoyed the overall content of your remarks, but uh, I think conspicuously absent was any extended reference or any reference for that matter on the Persian Gulf. And I think that certainly is one of the hot spots today that does affect our national security. Uh, my question to you, sir, is I'd like you to comment on the assertion that our U.S. naval policy in the Persian Gulf is more symbolic than substantive, given two simple premises that if the Iranians Knowing, knowing the quest for martyrdom and the suicidal tendencies, if they wish to do a lot more damage to the U.S. ships, they certainly could do that. And conversely, if the U.S. wanted to obliterate Iran partially or wholly, we could do that too without having such a large naval presence in the Persian Gulf. Uh, would you agree or disagree uh, on, that, on the statement about whether our presence is symbolic or not? And, con and as a follow-up question, do you see any, any way of face-saving gestures or compromise between U.S. and Iran in terms of trying to get ourselves out of this dangerous uh, and divisive policy? The, uh, the several questions, I think, are... Um, is, that, is that the end of the question? Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> the uh, first question is uh, whether U.S. naval presence in the Gulf is simply symbolic or does it serve purposes beyond those which were mentioned? And that question rests upon the observation that perhaps Iranian suicide boats could do serious damage to the uh, American forces as presently concentrated, or uh, uh, as they presently exist. And then secondly, um, the, the forces uh, presently there uh, are really not appropriate to an attack upon Iran. The appropriateness of American forces in the Gulf is the first question. The second question uh, is whether there is any chance for political compromise between the United States and Iran. All right, I would say that uh, I had never thought of it, uh, your premise about symbolic presence vis-a-vis -vis a military capability. Uh, I guess I'd have to agree that in a sense our presence is symbolic. It's symbolic in that it represents the resolve of our country and with the, the presence of those units from our allies, a willingness to commit themselves to maintaining free access to a very significant portion of the world's oil supply, the free world's oil supply on a day-to-day -day basis. It also is symbolic, I suppose, in the sense that our presence there, uh, setting military capability aside for a minute, has given a sense of resolve to the members of the Gulf Cooperative Council who now 
feel a little more able to speak openly and to support what they feel is in their best interest as opposed to being totally coerced by Iranian threats. As to the level of forces, uh, those forces currently in the Persian Gulf itself are there and are tailored for the job at hand, specifically adequate capability to do mine sweeping as necessary to provide escort or protection of shipping going through that area. And clearly the forces inside the Gulf are of themselves inadequate to do other than minor retaliatory damage or self-protective damage uh, to Iranian forces. It's a fact that Iran could, with considerable effort, uh, do damage to our ships. It's also a fact that there is sufficient force afloat at any given moment in the North Arabian Sea in the Gulf of Oman in the farm uh, in the past of both carrier and battleship battle groups, currently a, battle, a uh, carrier battle group, to obliterate any or all of those things which Iran holds dear in terms of its military and economic capability. So in that sense, I think there's a standoff, the one side recognizing that the damage it could cause would be met by a retaliatory force that would not be in their best interest. Uh, as to your final question, uh, is there a face-saving way between us and them? Uh, my own response to that uh, would tend toward the side of when they stop conducting what I consider to be international piracy, then I think there is room for a possible face-saving or whatever you want to call a reduction of forces in that part of the world. But until that happens, I don't see that coming about. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. There have been repeated accounts of uh, Soviet naval adventures into Swedish and occasionally even Norwegian waters. Uh, do you feel we are doing enough to help those nations deal with that threat? Is the United States doing enough to deal with the Soviet threat uh, as it may affect uh, certain of the Scandinavian countries, for example, and the incursions into territorial waters, I presume, is the uh, object of the question. Right. There have been uh, repeatedly over the years reports by the Scandinavian countries of incursions into their territorial waters well inside their claimed territorial waters by Soviet uh, submarines. Uh, the most visible factor, I guess, is that whiskey submarine that was sitting on the rocks just off the coast of Sweden, clearly well inside any claimed territorial seas. Uh, you say, are we doing enough to help them? Uh, that's a difficult question to answer because I wouldn't tell you in this forum exactly what we might do, but I would note that they are sovereign countries and would not, under normal circumstances, be asking us to step in and enter their territorial waters for the purpose of uh, carrying out operations in those seas. Yes, sir. Admiral, you indicated that one aspect of the maritime strategy calls for United States SSNs to enter the Soviet uh, submarine bastions near Kola to, for the purpose of sinking SSBNs at the onset of say, conventional war in Europe. I was hoping you might give us your comments on how you feel the Soviets would respond to the United States taking out uh, such a large part of its strategic reserve. A reference had been made to American action against uh, uh, Soviet naval vessels. Uh, the question is uh, how the Soviet Union would respond if a serious part of its naval potential was taken out. Uh, first of all, let me clarify exactly what I did say. I pointed out that their concern about our ability, and it has been stated as a portion of our strategy, to take on their strategic missile submarines is one of the factors that drives them to want to declare that area, the so-called Bastion area, as a submarine-free, an anti-submarine-free zone. And this past 1st of October, the entire area, including the Norwegian Sea, the Northern Sea, the Greenland Sea, and the Baltic, as northern zones of peace from which U.S. naval forces would not, uh, would, would be excluded in peacetime. Uh, what would their reaction be? Uh, we have often said, and my predecessor in describing this particular capability noted that if you encounter a submarine at sea, it is a submarine. And it's difficult to tell that he's carrying this kind of weapon or this kind of weapon until he shoots it at you. And therefore, the tendency for most submariners encountering another submarine would be to sink him and then wonder what he was, uh, <laughs> being certain that he was enemy. Uh, there's been a lot of speculation as to what the Soviet Union's reaction might be to, as you noticed, a significant portion of their strategic reserve uh, capability being destroyed or damaged. Uh, the arguments that have been set forth are several fold. One is that they would expect a certain number of submarines at sea 
to be targeted and to be lost to our forces in time of conflict. Another is that if either side loses a significant portion of something which is very necessary to them in an overall war fighting concept and upsets their plan of action or you know the Redskins game plan or whatever you will uh, I'm sorry I'm in the wrong town but uh, but uh, at any rate this would throw them off balance and make them pause as to whether or not their aims in this particular case let's say Central Europe were worth the potential loss and their inability to retaliate with strategic forces if we came to that point, if we crossed the threshold. So, you know, I, I could go on and on. A lot of people have written a lot of topics on what the reaction might be. And I think most of us, at least I'm one of those who would say that I know little enough about how they might react to give you a precise action, but to say it would probably be one of the above. There are two questioners. Uh, first, the gentleman who's third row from the rear. Yes. What is your uh, opinion of the SDI program, and what do you think the likelihood of it is that it will achieve the President's goals for that program? Uh, would you give us your opinion of the SDI program, and then specifically comment on the chances for the President it's, uh, achieving his goals? Well, that's a difficult one, and you probably should ask that of a political appointee and not a man in uniform. Um, <laughs> The program has a very, very strong impetus uh, as a result of presidential support, as you well know. In the scientific community, there's a rather considerable debate as to whether or not you can really do something that is adequate to the task or whether it's easier to overcome it by simply building more missiles. I think the reason the Soviet Union put, put such a uh, stress on the reduction of our SDI efforts, elimination actually, not reduction, uh, in any future arms control agreement uh, lends weight to the fact that they're quite concerned that if they have an honest-to-goodness 50% reduction of ballistic missile reentry vehicles under the START Treaty, that then any marginal capability that we might develop in SDI, marginal or full-scale, but even a marginal capability, would tend to tilt the balance and take away some of the advantage they might otherwise enjoy. Uh, I would note that there is every evidence that they are probably further ahead than we are at this point in time in many aspects of SDI related research. So one again might be a little skeptical and say, are they interested in eliminating this for any reason other than the fact that it would eliminate something in which they see themselves at a disadvantage at this time because our technology might give them cause to pause in their evaluation of how they might react. Yes, sir, in the rear. Sir, a Persian Gulf versus three-part question. Number one, would you know offhand what the daily expenditure is to the American public for our forces being in the area? B, uh, do any of the governments that benefit from our forces being there contribute to any of our expenses? And C, how is the determination made for the size of the force there? The uh, question is how much do the Persian Gulf co uh, forces cost the United States, how much do the nations of the Gulf region contribute to the support of those? The governments that governments. are benefited, there are also governments that receive the oil, and they are not directly in the Persian Gulf. Japan and European countries are recipients of the oil also, not only in the Persian Gulf. How much is being contributed not only by the Persian Gulf states, but by any nations of the world that might be benefiting by what we're doing there. And then finally, uh, how do you decide on who's going to pay for this? Uh, all right, I think... The, also the question of how do you decide on what forces will be in right, the... How do, how do you decide the forces that should be there? Uh, first of all, the uh, costs to our government are an incremental cost above the normal operating costs of maintaining the forces that are there. Uh, which currently amount to 12 to 15 million dollars a month. The cost reimbursement that you refer to is in part in the form of fuel and other support, logistic support from some of the countries immediately in the Gulf. Several of our NATO allies, as you know, uh, are providing forces in the Gulf to help in the mine sweeping capability where it was required, and they maintain a presence there. Uh, several others of the NATO allies uh, maintain 
combatant ships there to contribute to the overall, I'm here, don't shoot at these ships that are under my general uh, view, if you will. Countries such as Japan contribute in providing increased support to the cost of our forces currently based in and operating from Japan. Korea is doing a similar thing. I can't give you the dollar amounts because I don't know them. Now, your final portion of the question on how do we decide what forces should be there, it's based on the on-scene commander's judgment and on the judgment of the commander-in-chief Central Command who is responsible for our force operations in that area as to what is necessary to do the escorting, the mine sweeping, the deterrent role that we are carrying out. Yes, sir, at the microphone. What is your impression of the sudden hasty departure of the recent Secretary of Navy? Uh, <clears throat> what impact do you think that will have upon naval program? And how much will that help to reduce, if at all, the intended 600 ship Navy? That was the goal of the recent Secretary of the Navy. Would you uh, comment upon the recent departure of the Secretary of the Navy and the impact that that will have upon uh, several things, but especially the 600-ship Navy. All right. I think I should begin with the 600-ship Navy, since uh, Secretary Webb indicated that his departure was the result of his disagreement with actions directed by the Secretary of Defense, which, among other things, called for the early, the early decommissioning of 16 frigates, therefore making the achievement of that goal, that numerical goal of the 600-ship Navy, uh, impossible in the next fiscal year, and deferring that goal into the next decade. Uh, before I go further, let me note that while that numerical goal has not been achieved, we will, except for numbers, achieve the principal goals of the numbers of deployable carrier battle groups, battleship battle groups, submarines, amphibious lift and support, sh support ships that are at the heart of that group grouping known as the 600 ship Navy. Uh, Secretary Webb noted that he didn't like this, these force cuts because he felt they were unnecessary and because he had offered offsets in meeting the decrement to our 89 budget, which had been submitted last year and which was just resubmitted, that those offsets that he had offered were, in his view, more logical and better in the long-term interest of U.S. national security, that there were other cuts to the defense budget with which he disagreed and that there were certain policy issues with which he disagreed. And being a man of very considerable principle, he felt that he couldn't stay on and support that secretary or his budget and therefore retired or resigned from uh, the job. Uh, contrary to uh, comments from some of you earlier this evening, it wasn't my fault. I didn't drive him out. Uh, <laughs> the impact, however, is uh, more perhaps on me and on the Undersecretary of the Navy, who is now the Acting Secretary until the new man is confirmed by the Senate, in that we are carrying the burden of the testifying before the Congress and the briefings that have to take place in uh, the Pentagon and elsewhere in support of Navy programs. I think uh, in a sense, each of our recent secretaries has left an impact on the Navy that was quite positive. John Lehman clearly made quite an impact in the rebuilding of the Navy. Uh, Secretary Webb has gone a long way in restoring the confidence of many of the people in the Navy in their organization. And he was every bit as hard a charger to achieve that goal. So I think the long-term impact will be perhaps that he will have stirred some debate, uh, but uh, the long-term impact on the size of the Navy will probably not be that great. That remains to be seen. Yes, sir. The new generation of Soviet submarines has made it difficult for, to find submarines in the water. Do you feel that the Navy should push more for anti-submarine warfare aircraft? The general question is whether the Navy's anti-submarine defense capability is adequate. The specific question is whether uh, anti-submarine uh, aircraft should be uh, pushed for. Okay, let me give you a slightly more general answer. The uh, improvements in Soviet submarine capability that we've seen in recent years have had the effect of narrowing the margin of superiority that our anti-submarine warfare forces enjoyed over their submarines. As a result, uh, my stated priority, supported by the Secretary of the Navy, has been to make anti-submarine warfare across the board the top priority. Now, that says that we should, in all aspects of anti-submarine warfare, in all platforms, provide greater support and provide that 
with a priority over some other areas of naval warfare. And we are doing that, including improvements in the capability of existing anti-submarine warfare aircraft and also looking at a new generation which has greater on-station endurance, a lot better fuel economy, and can carry more weapons with it when it goes out to search for submarines. Representative Bentley. Hi, Admiral. Admiral, I'm glad to see somebody who still has some doubts about the seriousness of the Soviets. I mean, about the, uh, uh, what the Soviets want to do. I have a twofold question. One is, on the 12 to 15 million dollars a month that the Persian Gulf is costing us, how much maintenance work is being postponed on the ships and delayed? And of course, we have a selfish interest in that here in Baltimore. We want some of that work. Uh, secondly, I understand there's a team from the Soviet Union in Washington today, arriving today, to negotiate opening up all of our ports to Soviet ships. What's going to happen with that? The representative okay. has, has two questions. Uh, the first is, uh, what is the impact upon the expenditures in the Persian Gulf about, on delay of maintenance for those in other ships? And secondly, uh, would you comment upon the possibility of opening, opening all American ports to Soviet vessels? Uh, to your first question, uh, Ms. Bentley, the, uh, clearly there is an impact on the maintenance of those ships. Uh, those ships out there are at sea an average of 78 or 79 days per calendar quarter. Normal steaming for deployed units is funded for 50 and a half days per calendar quarter. So they're not in port getting the maintenance they need. They are getting some. And uh, where they're getting it is from, uh, for example, one of our four deployed either destroyer or submarine tenders, depending on which is on station in the Indian Ocean at any given time. They are getting some time alongside there. Some of them get down to Diego Garcia for repair work from time to time. But all of them leave the Gulf and come back home with a backlog of maintenance work that was not accomplished while they were forward deployed. Uh, of course, where that goes and where that uh, work is accomplished depends on where that ship is, is home ported, of course. Uh, that becomes a considerable problem. I forgot the second part of the question. The second question was, uh, would you comment on the possibility of American ports being opened oh, yes. to Soviet vessels? Uh, I'm not familiar with this specific team. I do know that the Soviet Union has for many years sought greater access by all types of vessels to our ports. And I do know that we are sometimes in the Department of Defense given the opportunity to make a contribution to a damage assessment or risk assessment of such access. And we recently did such an assessment and provided it, uh, in our case, to the Secretary of Defense. And I do know that that assessment included. It was good to have you join the members of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs for this evening's session. A transcript of the program is available at a cost of $5. The Council is a private, non-profit, non-position-taking organization dedicated to foreign affairs education. Membership is open to the public, to all citizens seriously interested in foreign affairs. For membership information, Merely call the council at 727-2150 or write to Suite 2155 at the World Trade Center.